Well, I enlisted in, uh, went on active duty in November of 1942, five and a half months after I graduated from high school, age 18. I went on and was trained as an aerial navigator, received my commission in my wings at age 19 in, in February of 1944, and later in Fort February joined my crew in Sioux City, Iowa, what and was that's where hometown? we. My hometown is White Bear Lake, Minnesota, just a little ways from where we are right now. Um, and uh, I joined my crew there in Sioux City, Iowa, and we did our overseas training unit. Uh, went to uh, Kearney, Nebraska, and there were no B-17s. So then we took a train ride to uh, Newport News, Virginia and got on a, a ship that later became a banana boat uh, named the Horace Mann and went, uh, went overseas to uh, Oran, North Africa. Spent four or five days in Oran and then took a French ship from Oran to Naples, Italy. And then uh, those uh, narrow gauge railroad cars from Naples, Italy to uh, and those railroad cars were box cars, and uh, joined the, the 463rd Bomb Group. Uh, I thought our mess was about the same as theirs. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know. I, I used to purchase some eggs with my cigarettes because I didn't smoke, and I gave them to both the enlisted men's and officers' mess. Living, of course, we all lived in tents, our tent was a little smaller, the enlisted men's, because there were six of them, there were four of us. Uh, but I, I thought we lived about the same. Uh, there, uh, when, when, you're, when you're in any formal place, like in the U.S. or in a city, uh, it, there is a difference. Uh, and there's a difference between the rank of an officer I spent three days in Rome at the Vatican with uh, a major and a captain. Well, the captain and I could stay in the same hotel, but the major couldn't. He stayed in a hotel that was for majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels. And, and then there was one step above that for general officers. The lower ones were second lieutenants, first lieutenants, and captains. One of the neatest things that happened, I grew up in the Depression, and we were very, very poor. And so when people squawked about the food in the service, I thought it was okay, because <laughs> you got some every day. Uh, but while we were in Sioux City, Iowa, my pilot said, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to go out for a steak dinner tonight. Now, I had never eaten a steak like we eat today. All I had eaten is beef that had been an old milk cow that didn't milk anymore and they killed it and when my mother made it any kind of beef it was black because you had to cook it so long so it was tender enough to eat and he said you want to order a you want to order a steak with a pink in the center and boy was that good now when I came home on leave and told my mother that she said you die eating that raw <laughs> But that's probably one of the one of the neatest things I remember. Well, I I get a dozen for a pack of cigarettes, and uh, you know it was uh, probably uh, wouldn't look good now, but then uh, we we were doing everything to exist the best we could, and when when the aid farmer wanted more cigarettes for a dozen eggs, I told him, look, if you, if you get too tough with me, we'll buzz your chicken farm and the <laughs> chickens will quit laying. <laughs> you know, we threatened them. They were deadly afraid of American military people. And, and we, we took advantage of that. Now, the kids, we were nice to the kids. Uh, we got six candy bars a week and six cans of beer. The beer I took up and got it cold for the ground crew because they were darned important to us. But that, the candy bars, I never could eat those. I gave them to those little Italian kids, you know, they 
boy, they, they were malnutrition and they had uh, lice in their hair and oh boy, they looked terrible. And, and that was bad too because you gave a candy bar to one kid and then four or five and attack him and try to take it away from him. Well, you knew who was flying that day because when you went to briefing, they, uh, you, you met who was there. Now, in the 463rd, the way they briefed us, the four officers, the two pilots, the bombardier, and the navigator went to briefing. And then when we got down to the airplane, the navigator briefed the other six enlisted men on where we were going and, and any questions they had, uh, who was on the crew if we didn't have our own crew. And, and that provided the Germans with some information, I think, because um, we didn't have fences around our field and the Italians were in tough shape uh, financially and economically and food-wise and so they would they do anything to make a buck and so I, I think they reported a lot of that information that they may have overheard to the Germans. You know the ground crew didn't get near the uh, credit that they deserved you know we brought back their airplanes all shot up and dinged up and uh, they fixed them up. Uh, we brought one back from Budapest in late June of 1944 that had uh, about 300 holes this size from flak ground fire and uh, about uh, 30 holes this size from 20 millimeter cannons on the, from the German fighters. Because they used 20 millimeter, we shot 50 caliber. However, ours were effective at about 600 yards. The, the 20 millimeter were only effective at about 300 yards. But um, they made an awfully big hole in an airplane. That B-17 was a marvelous airplane. Man, it would fly, uh, you know, it would fly on two engines. Just, uh, it was amazing how it would fly on two engines. You never could tell. Uh, I flew one mission. Uh, I reported in one interview, it was the end of August 1944. I looked in my log and it actually was uh, September 5th, 1944. We got down to the flight line and Colonel Kurtz came down and said he was going to fly in the right seat. And we moved from ABLE 2 to ABLE 1. That meant we led the group. And, uh, you know, that, that that would happen not very often, but sometimes. My crew finished, uh, except for the co-pilot, they finished in about 75 days. They all finished in, in August, uh, before the end of August. And I didn't finish till the 12th of September. We happened to get there right at the time when they were flying a lot of missions and they lost a lot of men. Uh, when, when I first got there, they said, you probably will fly with another crew other than your own, and you'll fly before your crew. And I said, why is that? And they said, uh, are you that dumb? You can't figure that out. We've lost a lot of navigators. Uh, one, one of the advantages I had, I think, was um, my pilot was about the same age as Major Pat. He was eight years older than me. He was 28, I was 20. And uh, you, you know, at 20, you, you develop pretty fast uh, in, in becoming mature, but you couldn't be mature like a 28-year-old guy. And my pilot was a great guy on the ground, but boy in the air, he was an iron britches. You did things the way he said. And, and that was very important, like talking on the intercom. He just didn't allow that unless you had something to say that contributed to the mission. Like when I told him you got to turn left five degrees, that, that, that kind of thing was all right, or if you saw a fighter plane or something of interest. But otherwise, there was no idle chatter. The other thing that was I had a lot of fun with, I have never drank. So when, you know, we got two ounces of booze when we got off the mission, I had it put in a 
bottle for my pilot. <laughs> now he never drank while we, close to the time we were flying, but he liked the toddy or two when we weren't flying. So that that was kind of funny. And you know, I I razzed him about that. I told him I'd make him pay for that. And uh, you know, we had a lot of fun over that. Uh, I'm a, I'm kind of a big tease, so I I always teased a lot. <laughs> You, you know, that was one of the things that in many times that I've been at an air show that uh, a lot of women my age question, why did we have those Varga girls? You're aware of the Varga girls that were painted on the nose. Oh, yeah. You know, they're pretty mild by today's standards, but they were pretty risky for those days. Sure. <laughs> and they'll question why we had that. And I remember one lady had a... Uh, I, a time that we did a uh, seminar, there were probably 400 people there, and they had a man from every position on the crew, and some lady about my age, this was probably 10 years ago, so she was probably about 80, uh, at least she looked about the same age as me. She asked, uh, she said, uh, why would you have those girls painted on the nose of your airplane? And nobody else would answer, so I said, well, I'll answer. I said, ma'am, what do you think we were doing when we weren't flying when you're 18 to 25 years old? And she said, well, I have no idea. And I said, well, we were chasing babes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the planning of these missions, uh, as I look back, was so terrific. Uh, the, the men that planned them were so experienced and knew what targets to hit. The thing that I see now is uh, that must have been a terrible responsibility when they sent men into battle. I always think of uh, President Eisenhower when he was a general and, and when he got ready to send the men into D-Day, he knew we were going to lose a lot of people. My responsibility was the air war in Europe. That's all I, all I knew. As you know, we got double credit for some missions. Whenever we flew north of 47 north latitude, uh, we got a double credit because you went over the Alps, and the Alps were tough to fly over, particularly coming home if you were shot up pretty well. Um, I flew to Palesti three times, twice they were double missions and once it was a single mission. And that was a tough target. That was probably, uh, that and Vienna were probably the most heavily defended targets that we went to. And I can't tell you about Berlin because I was back home long before they went to Berlin. Uh, but uh, Vienna was heavily uh, defended and so was Palesti. Palesti and uh, Vienna both had a lot of flak and, and a lot of fighters. Now the fighters, you can do something about it, you can fight back at them. The flak, you can't do anything about that, you just, but you just fly through it. Particularly the, any time uh, when you reach the initial point, that's where you open the bomb bay doors. And that's from 6 to 20 minutes before you get to the target, and that's a that's a long time to fly straight and level when, when there's flak coming up at you because they know exactly how high you are, what your uh, speed is, because those tr contrails from the hot engines and the cold weather uh, let them have a good idea of where you were. And flew my first mission on June 16, 1944, 10 days after D-Day completed my missions on uh, September 12, 1944, 88 days later. Mm. Of course, uh, were there any adventures? Yeah, the whole thing was kind of adventuresome. Uh, we, <laughs> you're, you're never prepared for what, what happened. Um, I, I remember on the first mission we went to a suburb of Vienna, Wiener Neustadt, and about 100 miles from the target, this black stuff came up in the sky. And uh, the, the, the way our group operated is when you got over there, your crew, less the co-pilot, went on the first mission. 
and your pilot flew in the right seat and you had an experienced pilot in the left seat. And I said to him, what's that stuff out there, that black stuff in the sky? He said, that's flak. And he said, if it's black, don't worry about it. But when it's red, then, then be worried because it's getting close and it's going to hit you. One other thing that was, uh, I think, funny that I look back on, because Colonel Kurtz remembered this, after the first mission, I, I, I suppose he did this with most guys. He came around and he said, Lieutenant, what did you think of that first mission? Boy, I said, Colonel, you know, I'd make a lot better lover than fighter. <laughs> <laughs> You know, at 25,000 feet in the summertime, it would be maybe 85 or 90 when we took off, uh, or when we landed, when we took off, it wasn't that hot because it was early in the morning. But it would, it would be 30 to 40 below zero at 25,000 feet. Now in the wintertime, it was 60 to 70 below zero. Uh, we had those heated suits and they, they were pretty effective. The airplanes had the same thing as you have in your cars today, a 12-volt system. And so that worked pretty well. Uh, if they didn't work, we always had uh, sheep-lined, the leather jackets that were sheep-lined with us to keep us warm. And now, as a navigator, I had to make a lot of notes in my log, so I wore a silk glove while I was writing. And that was pretty effective and then put the regular glove on when you weren't writing. You noted everything that happened. Uh, what, what planes you saw go down, how many fighters you saw, uh, anything that was of interest. Uh, I remember one time coming home from northern Italy, we spotted some uh, submarines in a port in Italy and we reported that and I think fighter bombers went back and sunk those submarines. But they, uh, you noted everything because that, they put that all together with what they, what they wanted to do in the next mission or that, that same day. Um, in, in our group they interviewed everybody after the, they debriefed everybody but they kept the navigator a little longer because he had the written record. And so that, that gave them an idea. Where, where the ship went down, uh, if you could, uh, which ship it was, uh, what position it had been flying in, if you could, you get the number of it. Um, how many men got out, if you, if you knew that. Or if some of the other people on the crew reported to you what, wh how many men got out. Uh, th there was some exciting fun at times. Uh, one time when we were going up into Germany, uh, the fighters, our escort didn't get through because the weather was bad, but two groups of us got through the weather. We didn't hear the recall. 463rd was ahead, the, the lead group, and the 483rd was behind us. And the fighters got after the 483rd. I think they took down 17 mm -hmm. of 28 planes, um, and it was uh, it was something to watch them. The um, the our fighters finally got there. They finally came through the weather, and uh, it was fun to watch the aerial combat between the Germans and the Americans. You know, the Americans, the guys went over with maybe 300 hours in a P-51. The Germans had thousands of hours, and so, uh, but the American uh, fighter planes took could take them on. Yeah, they could take them on and beat them. Early, uh, early on, we encountered a lot of fighters, and uh, we did encounter fighters right up to the end because I finished in September. Uh, my last mission, I finally saw an ME two six two the first jet. He didn't make a pass at us, but he, we, we did see one. And that was a kind of a, out, he, boy, he was really moving. <laughs> yeah, we had a, we had a mission to Blechheimer, Germany, and uh, we had a new co-pilot with us. Uh, he was, um, 
his first mission, he was from another crew. And he was flying co-pilot with the nine of us. My, our co-pilot had his own crew by then. And on the way to the target, uh, a piece of flak about as big as this finger hit his elbow and took it off. And uh, we took him down where the bombardier and I were, and the, the top turret gun and the engineer got in the co-pilot seat. And he was bleeding profusely, plus he was screaming. And so uh, the bombardier put a tourniquet on his arm, and there was a Red Cross kit, and I had never looked in the Red Cross kit, you know, there no instructions. So I opened it, and there's uh, two shots of morphine in there. Well, I pulled his pants down and right through his shorts, I gave him two shots in the rear end. And in about 45 seconds, he was out. And because, uh, oh, he, man, he was in a lot of pain. <laughs> well, when we landed in the doctor, Major got on the plane, he said, uh, Lieutenant, what did you do to this guy? And I said, what do you mean did I do to the guy? He said, I'm not a doctor, I'm a navigator. And he said, well, did you give him two shots at once? And I said, yeah. He said, he was in a lot of pain. I said, he's alive, isn't he? And he said, yeah. And I, you, know, you know, you you just, uh, you, you get to the point where if he'd have been general, I probably would have smarted off to him. <laughs> they, they also had good information on how our aircraft how they performed and where to come in. Uh, finally, the, the, the German fighters would come in high toward the nose, toward the nose. Of course, they were always trying to get the pilot and the co-pilot. And they would turn as they got close to us and turn their bellies up because that's where their uh, armament was. And. Uh, that uh, some of the statistics that I've seen, you know, there are all kinds of statistics, and you don't know which ones are accurate. But the, the most vulnerable person on the plane was the navigator, and the reason for that was that the fighters were after the pilots, and they didn't always hit the pilots, but they hit the nose of the airplane. They also at sometimes made head-on attacks on us. They, they were very, very capable flyers, the Germans. Uh, now, the, the Germans had a clever way of getting information about us. Uh, uh, they hired clipping services here in the United States. Now, it went through five or six hands before it got to them. But from local newspapers, that's how they knew a lot about us. For instance, the White Bear Press had a big write-up about me before I went overseas. And I didn't tell where I was going because I didn't know where I was going. But it, you know, told all about me. So uh, if I had been shot down, they probably would have had that information. German, most German officers had gone to college in the United States. They went Yale, Harvard, Brown, and Columbia were the four that most of them went to, so they spoke perfect English. And, and that when they debriefed prisoners, they got a lot of information from them uh, just by the fact that they already knew a lot about them. Just think of the men on the ground who sometimes were in combat yeah. for 30, 40, 50, 60 days. Can you imagine never mm -hmm. having a shower or a change of socks yeah. in, in that long? See, as I said this morning, I, I think we get more credit than they do us. And it's the romanticism of flyers. When I go to a school to talk, they always have flyers. They don't have, uh, between now and uh, the 1st of December, I have three speaking engagements. Uh, one is in a church, one is before an adult education group, and one is in a uh, assisted living. Mm -hmm. And they they don't have any they don't have any people from the navy or from the from the infantry. They have flyers, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I I think we get an over amount of uh, 
credit, not, not that we didn't do a lot to win the war, but everybody did. There were 16 million of us in the military. And you know, there, there are just over a million of us left dying at six to seven hundred a day. So we'll be a, we're a vanishing group of men. I, it's, it's hard for me to tell you now. I remember after 35, you know, there was a, a doctor, a flight surgeon, and that was kind of a misnomer. He, he was, he was just out of medical school. I think he was 28 years old. He was a captain. And after 35, he said to our whole crew, I had 35, and I, I suppose some of my crew maybe had a few more than that. He said, you guys have had enough. You've got to go to the Isle of Capri for a week. And that, that was a great relief. You, you, uh, you, turned the, you turned the war off for a week. And um, I, I was particularly fortunate. I was walking down the street in the Isle of Capri, and I heard somebody holler, Sam. That was my nickname in high school, and here was a guy that was a year ahead of me in high school that was a P-47 and a P-51 pilot. And we spent a lot of time that week together. And uh, that uh, we talked about, you know, the kids we went to school with, and that was a great relief. It's hard for me to tell how that, um, how that affected me at that time. Because now I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, get, along, get into the negative things. I, I try to think about the positive that ha things happened in World War II. I met some great people, and I'm kind of an eternal optimist. I, I, don't, uh, I look at life pretty optimistically, and so I, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the bad things that happened. I, I just think uh, how fortunate. I often wonder why God let me survive and others didn't. Uh, but uh, I think my father, uh, my father was a wise man. He had a third grade education, <laughs> but he was a wise man. He said, son, he left home as a kid and he came back a man. Mm -hmm. I think that put it pretty well. Uh, when I came back, my father and I, uh, my father was already in business and he took me in as a partner. We were heating sheet metal and air conditioning contractors in White Bear Lake. He died very suddenly in 1949 at age 58. I sold the business in 1954 and I went on the road for three years traveling for a supplier. And then I went into financial services business and he in 1957, and I still work 20 hours a week in that business. We do financial planning and sell insurance and investments. I have a 47-year-old partner uh, who brought my business in, in 2006, but we work together as partners now. Now, he, he works a lot more and a lot harder at it than I do. But, uh, as it should be. Yeah, but we, we, have a, we have a great time working together. He's a marvelous young man. By the way, he was a Navy SEAL yeah. during um, the first uh, desert storm. Mm -hmm. So we have a, although he, he you can't get him to talk much about his, uh, I think some of the things that he knows are still uh, classified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't talk much about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some commonality between men that have served in, in combat. In harm's way. Yeah. yeah. And and he was he was a naval officer, so we have that common 